By a raise of hands, how many people here are Latter-day Saints? Ooh, I like that. How many people here are Evangelical or Protestant? How many people here are Catholic or a form of Eastern Orthodoxy? Um, how many people here are Jewish? Anyone here undecided? This room has great religious diversity, and I thank you all for coming tonight. Jeremy, I'd like to thank you and your church for hosting this debate. It's a chilly November night with hot chocolate stands and lights all over the Utah Valley. You could have spent it with you know, having a wonderful romantic evening with your wife, but you're here with me, and so uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. In 1893, B.H. Roberts bravely and profoundly challenged the doctrine described to God during the Great Apostasy. He stated, to assert the immateriality of God as substance is not only to deny his personality, but his very existence. For an immaterial substance cannot exist. It can have no relation to time, space, no form, no extension, no parts. An immaterial substance is simply no substance at all. It is a contradiction of terms to say a substance is immaterial. It is the description of an infinite vacuum, and the difference between the atheist and the orthodox Christian is one of terms, not of fact. The former says there is no God, and the latter in his creed says God is nothing. One of the creeds Roberts was referencing is the Westminster Confession of Faith. In order to be as accurate and respectful as possible, I'm going to read an excerpt of the description of God from this creed. There is but one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free. You'll notice the words invisible, incomprehensible, and without body, parts, or passions. These words are sandwiched between pretty and worshipful words to essentially distract from a problematic theology. Most pure spirit, infinite, perfect, incomprehensible, invisible, most wise, most holy, and absolute. This is essentially what politicians do in writing bills, use emotional language that cries goodness, and then state the problematic reality and close with more pretty language. The reality is there is no way to worship or have a relationship with or understand something invisible and incomprehensible. So it is with immateriality. Webster's Dictionary defines immaterial as not consisting of matter. Christian apologetics, research, and ministry defines immaterial as that which is immaterial has no physical substance. Other Christian and Catholic scholarship and websites use very similar language to this. Using Webster's Dictionary, I will replace the word substance with the various definitions listed to gain a better understanding of what substance means. God's nature is immaterial. Immaterial has no physical substance. I believe this is a fair, bare-bones description of an immaterial God. So let's replace the word substance with its subsequent definitions. God's nature is immaterial. Immaterial has no essential nature. God's nature is immaterial. Immaterial has no ultimate reality that underlies all outward manifestations and change. God's nature is immaterial. Immaterial has no practical importance. God's nature is immaterial. Immaterial has no physical material from which something is made or which has discrete existence. Again, these definitions are from the dictionary. With close examination, we find that immaterial cannot exist. The only way immaterial can exist is if it is an idea. Now, if the goal is to show that God, angels, or even demons are immaterial, we must reason together to find out if this standard is possible. I challenge the audience here tonight to give one example throughout the night as you're thinking of anything immaterial that is not an idea. For example, love is immaterial. Hope is immaterial. Logic is immaterial. None of these things are matter, but they are real. They exist, but only as ideas. They do not exist outside of us. The closest you can get is gravity or time. Gravity itself is an idea. That which goes up must come down a regulatory declaration of that which is material. Time is as well immaterial, an immaterial uh, but a standard given by material people on a material world to material things. Both are still ideas and heavily dependent on material things for their recognition and explanation to be possible. 
I'd like to quote Parley P. Pratt, one of the original 12 apostles of the restored church, and the millennial, uh, the, the, the times and seasons, actually. He says, God the Father is material. Jesus Christ is material. Angels are material. Spirits are material. Men are material. The universe is material. Space is full of materiality. Nothing exists which is not material. The elementary principles of the material universe are eternal. They never originated from nonity or nothingness, and they never can be annihilated. Immateriality is but another name for nonity or nothingness. It is the negative of all things and beings of all existence. It has no way to manifest itself to any intelligence in heaven or on earth. Neither God, angels, or men could possibly conceive of such a substance, being, or thing. It possesses no property or power by which to make itself manifest to any intelligent being in the universe. Reason and analogy never scan of it or even conceive of it. Revelation never reveals it, nor do any of our senses ever witness it. It cannot be seen, felt, heard, tasted, smelled, or even by the strongest organs or the most acute sensibilities. It is neither liquid or solid, soft or hard. It can neither extend or contract. In short, it can exert no influence whatsoever. It can neither act nor be acted upon. And even if it does exist, it is of no possible use. Immateriality is the modern Christian's God, his anticipated heaven, his immortal self, his all. O sectarianism, O atheism, O annihilation. Who can perceive the nice shades of difference between one and the other? They seem alike all but a name. The atheist has no God. The sectarian has a God without body or parts. Who can define the difference? For our part, we do not perceive a difference of a single hair. They both claim to be the negative of all things which exist, and both are equally powerless and unknown. The atheist has no afterlife conscience existence beyond the grave. The sectarian has one, but it is immaterial and without body or parts. Here again, both are negative and both arrive at the same point. Their faith and hope amount to the same, only it is expressed by different terms. Immateriality. Again, the atheist has no heaven in eternity. The sectarian has one, but it is immaterial in all its properties and is therefore the negative of all riches and substances. Here again, they are equal and arrive at the same point. As we, not, as we do not envy the possession of them and all they claim, we will now leave them in the quiet and undisturbed enjoyment of the same and proceed to examine the portion still left for the poor Mormons to enjoy. So you can tell Parley P. Pratt was a bit harsh with his words, so I, I hope no offense was taken. In Genesis 1.26, when God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, it actually means image and likeness. Yes, in Genesis 5.3, when Adam makes Seth in his own image and likeness, it really means image and likeness to truly drive home the point as in Genesis 1.26. In Exodus 33.11, Moses means it when it's recorded, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And most importantly, in John 5.9, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For whatsoever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus Christ is the perfect representation of the Father. Christ is a man, so is our Heavenly Father. Thank you. Jeremy Howard now has 15 minutes to give his opening statement. This is a debate over the reality of God's supernatural existence. I'm thankful that Kwaku accepted my invitation to debate this evening. And the full title of this debate, which you may not be aware of, is, Is the Immaterial Triune God a Mere Idea? Now, there's some irony in this debate because most debates over materialism are between an atheist and a religious person. Uh, but, of course, this debate is between two, quote-unquote, religious people. In any case, what is at the heart of our disagreement is our presuppositions. The presupposition that I am here to challenge this evening is that the personal, immaterial God does not exist. 
This is the same presupposition that is held by all who suppress the truth and unrighteousness and deny the God who has revealed Himself. The first generation of Mormons saw this distinction as foundational. Joseph Smith said, quote, God Himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. That is the great secret. He also said, that which is without body or parts is nothing. There is no other God in heaven but that God who has flesh and bones. Orson Pratt, a mathematician and one of the first uh, apostles, one of the original 12 apostles of the Mormon church, said, quote, The heathen, in their wildest imaginations, never fancied up a God that could begin to compare with the absurd qualities ascribed to the immaterialist's God. And his brother, Parley, whom Kwaku just quoted, also an original apostle of the Mormon church, when talking to the Methodist branch of Protestantism, said this, Here then is the Methodist God, without either eyes, ears, or mouth. And yet man was created after the image of God. But this could not apply to the Methodist God, for he has no image or likeness. The Methodist God can neither be Jehovah nor Jesus Christ. Consequently, Methodism is a system of idolatry. Later in his life, he said, We say to the Christian world who hold to immateriality that they are welcome to their God, their life, their heaven, and their all. They claim nothing but that which we throw away. The early original Mormons made these statements because it was part and parcel to their worldview that God was a man, that he was an exalted man. And it continues to be part and parcel to the Mormon worldview today. In modernizing some of these older, more direct statements, Kwaku recently admitted, quote, with as much respect as I can muster up to my fellow Latter-day Saints, an alien is essentially who our God is. When you get into the science of it, we know that an immaterial God is nothingness, but a material God would have to be what we today call an alien. Amazingly, in the same video, he stated that Mormon theology regarding the origins of the universe, quote, isn't that far off from what amazing scientists and renowned atheists are saying. How can the Mormon worldview and the theology of the origins of the universe be so close to what atheists are saying? It's because of materialism, the worldview that nothing exists outside of that which is material. Before I get into my positive argument tonight, I want to read you a quote from a man I very much enjoy reading, a man named Doug Wilson. He says this, Something is eternal. Something has always been and always will be. Nothing comes from nothing, and since we are looking around at a great deal of something all around us in every direction, then something must have always been. The question before us, therefore, concerns whether that everlasting something is personal or impersonal. Another way of putting this is that either something or someone is eternal. There are really only two fundamental alternatives before us. Friends, that is so true. Something or someone is eternal. As I make my statement and as you continue to hear our arguments this evening, listen for the starting point of our arguments. The Christian starting point, my starting point, is the Bible, the revealed Word of God without which I can't comprehend the world around me. The LDS starting point is always his own standards, and he himself is the final decision maker when it comes to truth. Listen for authority, listen for adherence to God's Word. There is no God like the God of the Bible. God is fundamentally unlike creation. And as creator, he exists outside of matter. In Romans chapter 4, Paul is making a case for justification by faith. And he's calling the reader back to think of Abraham and saying how Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he believed the promise from God that Yahweh, the God of Israel, would provide him descendants. And in Romans 4.17, Paul says that, Abraham believed in God, God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Why could Abraham, who was as good as dead in his old age, Scripture says, why could he trust the God of the Bible? Because the God of the Bible, the one true God that exists, gives life to the dead, a life that he has in and of himself, not a life that he received from anyone else, but a life that he has as the self-existent creator. And he calls into being that which did not previously exist. 
Yahweh is the God of creation. He establishes things out of nothing. In Revelation 4.11, in seeing the heavenly vision, John scribed these words, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and listen to this, and because of your will they existed and were created. God not only puts things together as a master artist, which he certainly does, and he is, but God brings about. Because of God's desire, matter is. Because of God's will, all things exist. Like all other materialists, Kwaku believes matter just happened to be there. God could not create anything. He could only organize matter. But in just these two verses, we see that God's will causes matter to exist. He calls material into being, even though it previously did not exist. God is the unique, transcendent creator. Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host. For He spoke, and it was done, it says. In Psalm 96, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is contrasted with all the other gods. It says, For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but Yahweh made the heavens. What's the difference between Yahweh and all other gods? One of them made everything. The rest are all idols and just forms of creation. In John 5, 26, we learn from Jesus that just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. God has life in Himself. He doesn't get His life handed down from anyone else. He is eternally self-existent. In Colossians 1, we read, For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. In this passage, we see the Greek word katidzo. It means to form, to fashion, to create. And what was God forming, fashioning, creating? Those things that exist by His will, Revelation 4 says. The things that God willed to exist. God creates what did not exist before, and His will alone is beyond all human capabilities. It's qualified in this passage what things God created. All things, on, in heaven, on earth. Visible, invisible, all things were created by God. And it says in this passage that in God they are all sustained because their existence is dependent on His will. How could it say that, that in Him all things hold together? It's because all things are dependent on His will that they even exist. As the only transcendent, God exists outside of time. Psalm 90 says that God is from everlasting to everlasting. He has a unique relationship with time. In 2 Peter 3.8, it says, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. But with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. God is not subject to the same time limitations as we are. And as the only transcendent, God also exists outside of space. In 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon built his temple for God, he said, The heavens of heavens, the highest of heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I've made with my own hands. And in Jeremiah 23, God speaking through His prophet to the nation of Israel, He says, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? fills the heavens and the earth. God is absolutely immense. He is utterly inescapable. He is not subject to the same spatial limitations as we are. But what is most amazing in all of this is that the God who exists outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter, has made Himself known. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. 
His presence fills the heavens and simultaneously dwells with undeserving man. He began with the nation of Israel, and he now calls all men everywhere to repent through Jesus Christ. John's gospel begins with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have found the full revelation of God's transcendence and His eminence. God is a God who is an authority over all creation, and yet at the same time, we can know Him. We can have relationship with Him. He is personal with us. And we see that in the incarnation of Christ. God is and must be wholly other. He has revealed Himself in Trinity, an existence completely unlike ours. And no other worldview can account for the reality in which we live. Logic, morality, mathematics, all of these immaterial realities that we all enjoy and we all use, they did not pre-exist God. But they are eternally unchanging and immaterial truths because they are inextricably tied to the eternally unchanging and immaterial God. Kwaku has called these mere ideas or governing forces that would cease to exist if humans cease to exist. But these are not mere ideas. They are eternally unchanging, immaterial realities because of the eternally unchanging, immaterial God. Materialists live in this reality. Of course, we all do. But they reject the God who created the reality. Kwaku believes such immaterial laws are merely ideas of man, yet at the same time, his God is in full submission to them. The false worldview of materialism renders the God of all creation a mere creature who is just as submissive to the laws of nature as we are. Friends, no other God can account for this universe. All creation exists to bring God glory, for the heavens declare the glory of God, Scripture says. All things owe their existence to Him. He is utterly unique. Isaiah 40, verse 18, the prophet says, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare with Him? Don't take man and compare his likeness with that of God. God exists as an utterly unique being. In Romans 11, the Apostle Paul wrote, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. In Psalm 50, verse 21, speaking to to sinful Israelites, you guys need to hear this. God said to sinful, wicked Israelites, quote, You thought I was just like you. This is a warning to the Latter-day Saints in the room. You might think that God is just like you, but you cannot truly worship a God who is just like you. As Kwaku provides his rebuttal, remember to listen for authority in dealing with Scripture itself. His primary rebuttal against the God of Scripture is that God does not meet His personal standards of reason. This places Kwaku in authority over God, a position that ultimately will not stand. Thank you. Kwaku now has 10 minutes to give his rebuttal. All right. Um, can Can we let these two sit down? Is that all right? Wait a second. I, I hate being the person when I'm standing in the back. It's, it's the worst. So, sorry to draw attention to you. Um, so, I think it's really important to first examine the words all and eternal and everything listed in the Bible. So, Jeremy listed a number of scriptures describing how God is God over all, he created all things. He's all powerful. Well, what does all mean? you essentially have to go down a bit of a, a, a word rabbit hole. Because if you, if you define all, someone could say, well, all is everything. So I'd say, well, what is everything? Well, everything is, it's, 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 it's all. You, 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 get a, you get a rabbit hole of words and you get sort of a circle. There's, it's hard to define something like everything and all. However, 
if we follow the Bible only, we can see that the Bible gives us a, a, a context and a timeline of all, from creation to judgment. It doesn't tell you anything before creation. It doesn't tell you anything after judgment. Now, of course, Latter-day Saints would say we have the pre-existence and a number of things, but for those who just believe in the Bible, you only have the time frame of creation to judgment. That's all you have. So in regard to that, God is the God of all. He created everything because you have no standard in which to pull anything else from. So I agree wholeheartedly that God created everything, that God created all. But I challenge this notion that God can truly be God if he's outside of time and space. For example, how can God be everywhere and all-powerful and see what's happening here in time and space if he exists outside of time and space? Unless he partially exists in time and space and partially exists outside of time and space, but that is not what the creeds have written down and that's not what Jeremy espoused. If he sees all, he must exist in time and space. We're all existing in time and space. I think that's the unanimous agreement in the room. And I think we all agree that God right now is looking down and he can see what's going on. That can only mean that God exists in time and space. Another thing that's important is that to understand these differences between material and immaterial, we do have to recognize that my opening statement gave a definition of material and described a material God as well as an immaterial God. However, Jeremy came with an assumption that the triune immaterial God just naturally exists, and because of that, let's examine everything. But he didn't actually explain the nature and being of what an immaterial God is. That's very important. For example, if I if I went into a relationship with a girl, I took her on a date, and I said, I'm just going to assume that we're going to get married, I would be wrong. It doesn't work that way. You have to explain things first, and you have to paint a picture of what actually exists, what you're talking about. You, you can't, uh, you know, just jump off a cliff without recognizing that it is a cliff. Another thing that's important is we, we think about how God says, I am not like you. Well, one example of, of, of that is when the scriptures say that God is not a man that he should lie, right? But when you examine these scriptures, you find out that it's not speaking about God's exact nature and physicality and material. It's talking about his personality. He's not like the Israelites because he's not going to rebel against that, which is true. He's not like the Israelites because he's not going to sin. In fact, to quote um, Presbyterian scholar Meredith Klein in the Westminster Theological Journal, by setting the image likeness formula in context of sonship, Genesis 5, 1 through 3, re regarding Adam and Seth, being an echo of God making Adam in his image and likeness, contradicts the suggestion that image is a matter of representative status rather than of representational likeness or resemblance. For Seth was not Adam's representative, but as Adam's son, he did resemble his father. The terminology in his likeness serves as the equivalent in human procreation of the phrase, after its kind. So I think this is important to notice that even scholarship within the, the Protestant world is beginning to acknowledge this reality that there is a distinct material nature to God. Image means image. Likeness means likeness. God the Father actually means God the Father. I would like to end with one, um, one way to challenge uh, Pastor Howard. To say that God is not like us is to not understand Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus Christ come as a man and die? Why was he tempted? Why was he afraid? Why did he have fear? Why did he have righteous anger? He was like us. Do we all agree in this room that Jesus is God? Well, I hope so. And if you do, what does that mean? That means that God is like us. Jesus Christ is the perfect representation of the Father on earth. 
he does nothing but that which he sees the Father do. In which case, we can be very assured that God is like us and we can become like him. Thank you. Jeremy now has 10 minutes to give his rebuttal. So, again, God is both transcendent and imminent. And again, Christianity is the only, biblical Christianity is the only worldview that proclaims that truth. That God is one transcendent outside of time and space and matter, but we don't stop there like the deist. We see the incarnation of Christ, we see the involvement of God with man, and we proclaim that He is also imminent. He is also one who dwells with man. In that Isaiah 57, 15 verse that I read earlier, there was a phrase uh, that I passed over. It says, The Lord who inhabits eternity says, I dwell in the heavens and also with the contrite of spirit. He inhabits eternity, and yet he's with the contrite of spirit here on earth. Kwaku put forward in his opening statement the idea classification that you are all to think of a governing force that is not just a mere idea, uh, saying that God win, then would just be rendered as a mere idea. Well, there needs to be a differentiation between something that is an abstract reality and something that I'm proclaiming, a transcendent being who is personal, not just an it, but a he. And the problem is, once we recognize that God exists in a different category than logic or morality, that one has to come before the other. That creates a problem for the materialist religious person. And what I'm saying is that the two are distinct and God himself must exist in order for those abstractions to exist. The challenge of presenting another eternally unchanging and immaterial being is that there is not one because God is utterly unique. And so if we're challenged to name another eternally unchanging immaterial being who exists in Trinity, the whole point is that we can't. There is only one God. There is only one creator of all. There was a lot said about the image of God. And let me first say that we do not go to man to learn about uh, God's existence. But we go to God's existence to learn about man. And we learn from God's word. As I laid out in my opening statement, Scripture declares that God is utterly immense. He's aspatial. Totally and utterly inescapable. He fills heaven and earth, Jeremiah 23 says. And he has no bodily form. The substance of the image of God in which all human beings were created is primarily immaterial. In Genesis 2, the microscope of creation, uh, Genesis 1 is more of a telescope view, giving an overview of everything. And in Genesis 2, more of a microscopic view at how man was created by God. Uh, we see that the breath of God exists within man. When God fashioned man out of the dust of the ground, he breathed life into his nostrils. He breathed what is called in Hebrew the nephesh, or the soul, into man. What made man different from all the rest of creation? What made man different from all the animals? Well, man possesses what's called nephesh, a soul, an immaterial aspect. The image is far more complex than what could be found in a single man. Genesis 1.27 states that male and female established the image of God. Male and female, he created them, it says. There is a fundamental diversity that cannot be accounted for in a worldview that states that God, through celestial intercourse, made man in his image. But because God is who he is and man is who he is, there are to be no images made of God because God has no bodily form and God has already fashioned an image of God that's found in the nephesh, the soul of man. In Genesis 5, where it talks about Adam begetting Seth and Seth being in the image and likeness of uh, his father, Adam, it should not be understood as added, Adam created someone who looked like him physically. All the people who were reading Moses' words in the book of Genesis did not think that Eve gave birth to a horse. They didn't think that there would be a different animal or some sort of other being that came from Eve's womb. 
But instead, what was being said is that the image of God was passed on to Seth despite the fall. And it was passed on in a, in a fallen state. The image of God was not eradicated in Genesis 3, as some might think when they read the narrative. But instead, the image of God continued on in the, his son, Seth. And it continued on in such a way uh, that it was affected by sin, yet it was there nonetheless. Kwaku talked about substance, that if you are an immaterialist believing that God is not made of matter, then you don't believe there is any substance of God. It's a substanceless existence. Well, Greek has a word for substance. It's hypostasis. And you may not have heard that word, but maybe you've heard the theological term that comes from it, hypostatic union. It says in Genesis 1-3, or in uh, Hebrews 1-3, rather, that Jesus is the exact imprint of the hypostasis of God, the substance of of God. He is the exact representation of the divine essence. So we do believe in an essence of God. We do believe that there is a substance. The scriptures speak of it. There's a Greek word for it. We just don't start with the presupposition that it must exist within time and space. And that presupposition must be challenged because Webster Dic Webster's Dictionary is not authoritative. Webster's Dictionary has many different editions, but the Word of God is forever. Again, we believe in a God who is both transcendent and eminent, and that is seen in the incarnation of Christ. The Word became flesh, and what was the Word doing before it became flesh? It was in the beginning. It was with God. It was God. And it was a He, a personal, eternal, unchanging, immaterial being. We do have information in Scripture of what God was doing before creation and what will happen after judgment. If you read the last couple of chapters of the Bible, you read about a new heaven and a new earth and what eternity will be like with God. And if you read Ephesians chapter 1, if you read Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, we see what God was doing before creation. He was dwelling in glory. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was sharing in the glory with, with the Father before creation. And this glory, according to God's words in Isaiah 42, 8, this glory is a glory that can be shared with no one else. God doesn't share His glory with another. And yet we find the Son and the Father both sharing in the same glory. How can that be? Because God is eternal, and He is eternally revealed in three distinct persons. One being, one substance, one essence, and three distinct persons. He is both transcendent, beyond all human imagination, beyond anything that we could come up with by our own devices. And yet He is known because He has made Himself known. God has stepped into time. He doesn't have the same categories that we do. God is utterly unique, and He can both exist as transcendent and as imminent. And so listen for those presuppositions that say he must be one or the other. Where do we get those presuppositions? Not from Scripture, but maybe from Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. We have to go to Scripture first and derive our authority from how God has revealed himself. Thank you. For the cross-examination period, each speaker will have the opportunity to ask his opponent questions regarding his position over the course of two rounds. It is imperative that the one asking the questions only ask questions and the one answering questions only answer what is asked. First round is 15 minutes for each speaker, and we will begin with Jeremy cross-examining Kwaku. Do you agree with Parley Pratt when he said, nothing exists which is not material? I, I agree with, with him for the most part. I, I think he's being, you know, using some hyperbole to drive a, a point across. I've said the only exception would be an idea. That's, so mostly, yes. Okay. Um, do laws of logic exist? Yes. Are laws of logic immaterial? Yes. Are they eternally unchanging and certain? Perhaps. So they might not be eternally unchanging and certain? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not eternal right now. I don't know. I mean. So could you be wrong about everything you've said tonight? Because you don't know for certain if laws of logic are, are unchanging. Well, sure, I mean, the Hindus could be right. We could all be wrong, but I still hold that logic is an idea. Is so that true? Is what true, that logic's an idea? Uh -huh. Yes. And how do you know that? Uh, how do I know that that's true? Yeah. 
Well, I think it's the same way you come to any conclusion. You use reason and you, as a, as a person with agency, as a sentient being, you make a declaration that you are convicted by. Okay, but you could be wrong about everything you've said tonight. I it could be wrong about uh, many things, yes. <laughs> hey, um, why do you begin with the presupposition that time and space are necessary for real existence? Well, I asked the audience the question um, to give an example of something that would be immaterial, that would not be an idea. So I don't necessarily think I start with the presupposition, but I'm taking the, rather the, the, the plate of the ideas of a material god or immaterial god and testing both. I'm doing that, I've come to the conclusion that a god must be material to exist, but I don't necessarily find it to be a presupposition, rather a test. But you're testing that with standards that are uncertain. With a material or, or immaterial standard? Yeah, yeah, your tests are, the standards you're using in your testing are uncertain, right? Well, yes, but that's also what the debate is about, so I feel like that was an okay standard to make. Uh, you said um, in your video, I don't believe in the Trinity. You stated, if all of us were to die, all of our ideas would die. There would not be ideas because ideas come from human beings. So to say that God exists without physicality and to say that God exists of substance are all ideas. How should hypostasis be translated when it says that Jesus Christ is the exact hypostasis or essence of God? How should that be translated? So I do not at all agree with the current definition of, of the hypostatic union. I don't actually think it makes sense. Um, I would say that it's, if we, were to, to, if we were to define the holiness of Jesus Christ and his divinity, he was God before, and he became a man, and he is a completed, eternal God right now. So how should that word hypostasis be translated? Do you have any theories on that? Uh, not that I'm willing to say to an audience, no. <laughs> okay. Um, in your worldview, matter is self-existent, correct? Um, as far as we know from the, our, our universe to now, like the time period. So Latter-day Saints don't really make any declaration on before our universe, even before our God. We don't have a great understanding or idea that hasn't been revealed. So I can't comment on that. But you would state that it, was, it would be impossible for the God of the Bible to create out of nothing, right? R right. So I, I don't believe create, you can create anything if there's nothing. Okay. So, so you at least know that much. So matter ha had to be um, existent before God. I mean, yeah, I think that's a fair argument to make. So in Romans 4.17, when it says that God gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, that's creation out of nothing, right? Not necessarily, no. What does it mean? Well, that which does not exist is a pretty open-ended statement that can change depending on what audiences you're talking to, what theologies they have, and what the exact topic is that's, that they're addressing. So the, the word that's there when it says calls into being... Um, he gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. It's a not is the Greek word may, it's the negative, and exists is just the be verb. All things are things that weren't is essentially how it could be translated. He calls into being things that weren't. Um, doesn't that clearly communicate that things that are presently not he causes to be? Well, I mean, you can make that same example with it, it doesn't exist in this earth. So if a Let's say the Lord wanted to bring um, an angel we haven't heard of to speak to us, and it, he does not exist on this earth. He has called it into being. I mean, there, there are a number of different ways that can be true, and that can be, I mean, there, I could, you could have over 100 different ways that could be applied, and that could still be accurate. Do you have any theories on how Paul was using it with a specific intention for a specific purpose? Uh, I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> so. Well, I can only ask you questions, uh, right? <laughs> 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 Yeah. All right. Um, in Revelation 4.11, when it says that God created all things and because of his will they existed and were created, that's creation out of nothing, is it not? Not necessarily, because again, if you use, using the word all can only be, all can only be used to explain what we know of. You can't necessarily have a definition or declaration onto that which you don't know. So, like I said in one of my statements, all and everything applies to how much scripture has revealed. Anything before that 
you, you can't really make a declaration on. So if it's been revealed, we can say, yes, he created all things, but anything before that which he may have or may have not created, we can't, we can't go and say, oh, well, this, this biblical verse applies to what's not in the Bible. Well, it, it's making a distinction there between things existing and things being created, um, saying that because of his will they existed and were created. It's that same Greek B verb, because of his will they are and were created. Um, and so isn't there an emphasis on but all things coming into being before being formed and put together? Can you read that sentence one more time for me? Um, the, the verse itself? Yes. He, God created all things, and because of his will, they existed and were created. Yeah, to me, that sounds like he created something, and so it exists. Not, it does, okay, all right. Um, when Moses asked God for his name, God said his name is Yahweh, meaning I am. And that name declared to Israel and the rest of the world that their God is the eternally present one, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this name alone set the God of Israel apart from all other so-called gods? Well, it, 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 depending on the lens of, of ancient Near Eastern scholarship you're looking at it, I mean, it, it, it really can be... I mean, it, it gets into the mud, but yes, I, I agree that our God is real and other gods are not. And th but that name alone set him apart as the eternally present one that, that was distinct from all other gods? Well, yeah, I mean, God is, is speaking to them, so they're, they're, if they're talking to God, it, it's pretty clear that he's the one they're going to worship. Okay. Um, Numbers 23 and 1 Samuel 15, you made reference to both of those when they declare that God is not a man, therefore he cannot lie or change his mind. Uh, this refutes the Mormon idea of the man-God, does it not? Um, no. But it says God is not a man, so how, how do you reconcile that? Well, I'm not a man that I would deliver Amazon packages, but I'm still a man. I'm not a man that would go to the University of Utah, but I'm still a man. Right? You can be a man and not do certain things, and you still are a person. Don't you want a good beard? Go to the University of Utah. No, just, uh, <laughs> my, my, my beard is immaterial. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in Romans 3-4... In Romans chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. And, you know, the Numbers 23 reference is, God is not a man that he should lie. And Romans 3 says, Let God be found true, though every man is a liar. So isn't there a reference to his nature that's inextricably tied to his action? No, I think that, in fact, just supports what I said. Um, every man has lied. Every woman has lied. I mean, except for babies and things like that, right? But every person has lied and sinned. God does not lie or sin. God is not a man who would lie. God is not a man who would sin. So you don't, you don't believe that the biblical authors are tying God's nature to his morality and contrasting it with man's nature and his immorality? You don't think that's what's going on? No, I think they are, but I'm saying they're not tying his, um, his nature of morality necessarily to his physicality. Okay. Um, you mentioned God speaking face to face, Moses speaking with God face to face. How could God speak to Israel out of the fire in such a way that they spoke to him face to face? That's what Deuteronomy 5 says. They spoke to God face to face out of the fire, and yet they saw no form uh, of God. So how, how could they see no form and yet still be speaking to him face to face? Right. So when you examine any ancient text, you have to give a, a degree of charity to the, the poetic nature in which it's speaking. So if you're saying, you know, God spoke to them in the flame of fire or like the burning bush or things like that, we don't really know exactly what that means. Um, it doesn't mean a fire, an actual fire? Well, so for example, um, in Joseph Smith's first vision, um, one of the original accounts before it said pillar of light said a pillar of fire, right? So there is a, using these terms to what we would call supernatural things, I mean, we're not the authors of it. I'm, I can't exactly say what that looked like when it was a burning bush or when it was a, a pillar of fire. But it's anyone who, who, with an understanding of literary criticism or anyone who's just literate can understand that they're trying to paint a picture that it's something supernatural and none of us in this room really have a firm grasp of what exactly was taking place there. Do you say the same thing for the resurrection? No. Okay. Um, you've written, if God is God above all, 
he must be both physical and metaphysical, just like everything he created. Are there any ontological distinctions between God, the creator, and his creation? Yes. Well, obviously, right? So um, there, there's, a, there's big distinctions between God as our father and, you know, a mountain that he created, right? Like a mountain doesn't necessarily have agency in the way that God the Father has agency. A mountain doesn't necessarily make decisions in the way God makes decisions. He still created things. However, he is still physical. He's still made of, he's still God the Father. He's still a person. Is there any ontological distinction between God and man? Uh, yes. Could you elaborate on that? Um, men sin. Men are going to die. Men don't exactly know what's coming next, right? I mean, we could just read the scriptures and you could get a pretty... Well, pretty well nice lying thing. doesn't have anything to do with ontology. I mean, uh, the nature of being. I mean, God's nature and our nature. Um, besides the, the fact that... Well, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, I mean if, his, if his nature is that he's, I mean, honest, right? I mean, I'm trying to look at it through your lens of not being material and just immaterial. So I'm using, I'm trying to use immaterial terms to, to make it make sense, right? So honesty is, is an immaterial term, but that would be a part of his nature because he is without sin. Okay. I, that wasn't necessarily an answer. I'm just sort of trying to understand. Sure. Um, okay. And uh, just to be clear again, you could be wrong about everything you just said. I, I regret who I voted for last election. I could be wrong about a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, I'll yield the rest of my time. We can switch. Um, Thank you. In one of your statements, you said God is transcendent. Um, transcendent what? God is transcendent as, transcendent as a status of being. His existence transcends all creaturely limitations that we have. And, and what is his existence? Uh, I don't think I understand the question. Uh, it's, it's real uh, and personal. I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I suppose what I'm getting to here. So, transcendent is not necessary. Transcendent isn't a word that allows itself to be an identity. It's a description. So, I guess I'm asking: God is transcendent. Fill in the blank. Yeah, um, he is spirit. He is immaterial. He is immense. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is beyond any creaturely words that we could ascribe to him. We just we do our best with our very limited language. Hmm. Um, what is spirit? Spirit is an, an actual, immaterial, self-conscious being that can interact with the material universe. And what is immaterial? Immaterial is the lack of matter, as, as the name implies, um, meaning that it doesn't have mass, it doesn't take up space, it is um, not bound by space and time. Okay. It is a is substance that is not bound by space and time. Is it fair to say that, you just said there are no creaturely words you can use to really ultimately define what a lot of these things not are? Comp not exhaustively, no. Okay. Um, is it, would it be fair if someone used the term unexplainable immateriality, if they're trying to make a definition of God's nature? Um, in the same sense that I was just speaking, yeah, I mean, we can't exhaustively explain God's existence. Uh, we have, we are limited by many things, um, but first and foremost, it is how God has revealed himself. And so we can speak only where scripture speaks, and um, we can only speak in the, the languages that we know, which are limited by definition. Is, is, is that a good reason we should use a dictionary? What what what's what a good reason? I mean, she's a dictionary. I, I'm I'm being facetious. I'm saying, um, okay. how do you know you have a relationship with an um, an unexplainable immateriality? Uh, first and foremost, because God declares it, and so um, you know, one of the key scriptures in Christian theology is that the human heart is deceitful above all things, in Jeremiah 17. And so there are many people uh, in the world who think they have a relationship with God who don't, and um, there are many people in the world who have a relationship with God but go through seasons where he feels distant, though he isn't. It's because the human heart is deceitful and our flesh is, it falls short in so many ways. And so when, when God says that I am his child, it means I am his child. 
And how do you know the God that you have a relationship with is immaterial? Because he has revealed himself as such. Okay. So, just so I can understand, he, the immaterial God has revealed himself as immaterial, and you know that you have a relationship with him because he says so. Absolutely. Okay. Um, does that sound like it could be considered circular reasoning to you? Um, ab- yeah, it certainly could. It could be considered a whole lot of things, depending on who's making the, uh, <laughs> the qualification there. But, um, mm. you, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we all have to start somewhere. We all have to start with an axiom and a presupposition, and, and those can be tested uh, and should be tested. Um, can you find me a... Wait, I have my other questions right here. Um, can you give me, can you cite me a verse that states God is always first immaterial, but is material only for the sake of speaking to humans? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, all right. The, do, you, do, do, you, do you, okay, um, it's not, a, it's not like a, I can't give a rebuttal, so my hands are tied here, so I'll just let that go. Um, can you give an example of something Trinity outside your conception of God? No, that's the whole point of God being God, is that he is utterly unique. Okay. Um, is heaven on a planet? God has not said that, so no. I, where I, is heaven? It depends on um, where you're coming from. Do you have a scripture that... No, um, I'm just asking you, where is heaven? Sure. And by heaven, you mean... Could, could you clear, clarify what you where, mean by heaven? Where, where God and Jesus reign, where, where sure. you go after you die. Yeah, so, um, so there's a distinction between heaven and earth. Uh, heaven is the realm of God's existence, where God is, uh, where there can be no sin in his presence. And, um, you know, the, uh, the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool, it says in Scripture. And um, Scripture talks about heaven in a variety of ways. But where God dwells, it is not in a singular place because uh, God is not bound by space. And so um, what we can say for sure, if we're talking about a final place for man's soul, it's going to be in the presence of God, and in the end there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But to point to a place and say this is uh, the heaven part of the universe um, would, would just fall short on many biblical Definitions. Can you, can you be in the presence of something that isn't physical? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so when you say you'll be in the presence of God, do you, you don't mean that physically. You mean, does it mean you'll be more in the presence of his b- power, glory? What, what word would you put there? Sure. So um, I will certainly be physical. There is a glorification for all believers in which our bodies are uh, glorified and made immortal. This uh, mortal flesh will put on immortality, and we will be in the presence of Jesus Christ, who has a body um, since his incarnation. He has retained a body, and, um, and there will certainly be a physicality aspect to the existence in heaven, yes. Um, can people interpret Scripture and get false doctrine? Yep, they can't interpret Scripture correctly and get false doctrine, but yeah. Right. Um, are the Christian church fathers important in understanding historical or original Christian doctrine? Certainly. Do you agree with Clement of Alexandria when he said, if one knows himself, he will know God, and knowing God will become like God. His is beauty, true beauty, for it is God, and that man becomes God since God wills it. Men are gods, and gods are men. In the context in which Clement said that, um, I'm sure I would find agreement, yes. Uh, Church history is incredibly important um, but it's not authoritative, and it always has a context. And 2,000 years ago, they used words that we weren't using. They weren't using our language and our translation, um, especially when it's out of a certain context. Not saying you're taking it out of context necessarily, but just when it's pulled away from its context, it could come across as meaning things it was not originally intended to mean. Um, do you agree with St. Irenaeus when he says, while man gradually advances and mounts toward perfection, that is, he approaches the eternal. The eternal is perfect, and this is God. Man has to first come into being, then to progress, and by progressing, come to manhood, having reached manhood to increase, and thus increasing to persevere, and persevering to be glorified, to thus see his Lord. 
in the context in which Irenaeus was saying that um, the deification of the early church fathers or the, the patristic era fathers, um, in the context in which they were stating that, yes, there's agreement in speaking of the eventual glorification of man eternally as a creature, uh, but a glorified one. Um, in regard to deification and exaltation, do the scriptures or early church fathers ever make a caveat or difference in the nature of God the Father and us? Essentially, do they ever say anything along the lines of, we shall be gods, but only a god like Jesus, not a god like the Father? The early church fathers? Do, or you're asking are, if they make yeah, that, that distinction? That or in scripture. Like, do you know of any, any scripture that says that or any quote by a church father that says that? That says, can you read it one more time? I'm sorry. Essentially, anything along the lines of, we shall be gods, but only a god like Jesus, not a god like the Father. No, I don't think so. I, but I have a feeling something's coming, so let's get to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus Christ has a physical body as we speak right now? Yes, but not in the same sense that we have a physical body. But he, he is, I mean, he's, he is corporeal. You will be able to see him. He, he retains a physical body from the resurrection through his ascension, yes. Um, you do not believe that the thought, do you believe that God the Father has a physical or corporeal body? No. Do you believe then that these are two different species of God? No. Do you believe that these then are, that Jesus is not the express image of the Father? He absolutely is um, in the sense that, particularly Hebrews 1 talks about, that he retains all the perfections of the other two persons of the Trinity. Um, it is the, uh, in the incarnation, we see the manifestation of all the eternal and perfect uh, attributes of God. Do you believe that it's really all the eternal and perfect attributes, considering one has an attribute the other doesn't have? Um, what attribute, to which attribute are you referring? Well, one is corporeal and has a body, the other does not. Yeah, um, again, his body is not the same as the body that we have. For instance, um, in, at the end of the Gospels, after the resurrection, Jesus appears in a room without opening the door. Right. Uh, Jesus right. Um, promises to his disciples, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Well, I'm, I'm referring to the Father and the Son, right? So yeah. the, the, uh -huh. the Son has a body, the Father does not. I'm asking, then does the Son not possess all the qualities that the Father has? He certainly does possess all the qualities that the Father has, yes. And, he, and Jesus is not limited, um, though he retained a physical body, he is not limited by space because the, the physical aspect of the resurrection and the glorified nature of his body <laughs> Um, does not equate it to a body like yours and mine. So, ju just to be clear, you were saying that they, Jesus is the express image and he has all the attributes of the Father. Yes. In, in, ontologically, yes. Jesus is not a lesser being than God, right. the, God the Father in any way. But would you agree that one has a body and one does not? Yes, Jesus as the second person of the Trinity who has different function within the Trinity, who has a, a different role in the Trinity, Yes, he has retained his physical glorified body, yes. Would you count that as a difference between the two? Between the Father and the Son? Not in the nature that, that you're implying, which is that they are somehow two different beings now. No. Well, can you, can you discern one from the other? Economically, yeah. Like in the economic trinity, they have different roles and functions. They are distinct persons, absolutely. Huh. But ontologically, there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. How many persons exist in the Trinity? Three. Um, okay. Okay. Um, if you, can, can you, could you divide the, the Trinity into three parts? No. Can you count three persons in the Trinity? Absolutely. Do you, not, do you believe there is any sort of problematic approach between not parting but counting. No, and Christians have not noticed a problem in 2,000 years. I don't think I'm going to find one. Okay, I'm only asking questions. Um, <laughs> is it possible to literally walk and talk with God the Father? Yes. Um, when when you, you quoted earlier, the Word became flesh, uh, by all of your experience, how, how, how are wor words put into the world? Well, the word for word that's used in John 1 is the word logos, and that's an incredibly 
complex uh, study, yes, yeah. and it would take an entire debate to discuss what, what yeah, Logos yeah, yeah. meant. Um, but uh, the Word became flesh in that the eternal God, Jesus Christ, He emptied Himself and put on flesh, Philippians 2 tells us, and became a servant. He was found in the likeness of man, it says, and, and He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Did Christ exist as a part of the triune God before Adam and Eve existed on earth? I wouldn't say a part of. Did, did, did Christ exist as the third or second person of the triune God before Adam and Eve existed? He, eternally, he has existed that as God, yes. There was um, never a time when he wasn't. When the Word became flesh, was that the Word of the Son or the Father? The Word is the Son. Right. So if the, if the Word was the Son... Um, did the son have a physical body before Adam and Eve? No. Well, uh, no, he did not. He, he didn't have a physical body until the incarnation. Um, will the son, the son, and the son will keep his physical body. Right, yeah. Th after the resurrection, through the ascension, he retains a physical If you could somehow body. see the, tr the triune God, would you see, you would not, I assume you would not see three people. If, if that was possible, if I could, if, 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 God showed me himself in, in Trinity. Would I see three people? You can't see him. It's an irrelevant question. No, no man has ever seen or, or can see. Um, do you believe that Jacob saw God when he said, I've named the place Peniel for I've seen God face to face and my life is spared? In the, the context of him being, or him being a monotheistic um, original Jew, yes, absolutely, yeah. All right, um, I'll yield my time. <laughs> the second what happened at the incarnation regarding Christ and his nature? Are you referring to the, the, the bringing of the Son into the world? Yeah, what happened regarding his nature in the incarnation? Yeah. I, I assume you're referring to the, the virgin birth, Christ being born of a uh -huh. virgin. Yeah. Yes, that. <laughs> well, but, well, what could you explain in more detail um, his nature before the incarnation and then his nature after him? Oh, he sure. Was born? So before Christ started his mortal ministry, before he was born um, to Mary, he was who we identify as, for sake of clarification, Jehovah. He was a God who lived in heaven, who helped organize the earth along with the Father. He was that person when the Lord says, let us make man in our image. He was one of those people in the hour and us. And then what happened in the incarnation? Um, how did his nature change in any way? He took on a physical earthly body. He grew up. He learned. He atoned for our sins. And then he died for our sins. He was resurrected, and he went up to heaven. But before that, he went to visit the <coughs> Nephites in the Americas. Okay. Uh, Colossians, Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Uh, could you provide a definition for deity as it's used in Colossians 2? Um, could, you get, could you repeat that one more time sure. for me? Uh, Colossians 2.9, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That, that is, com that, yeah, that is Jehovah. That is complete Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ. Okay, um, so theotetos, the word that's used for deity, that just means the name Yahweh? No, so it's the same person, right? It is the same God that existed before Christ was on earth. Um, I don't believe it means all of deity, because that would then assume all of the hosts of heaven, right, would assume anyone in heaven, whether it be a, a gods or angels or perhaps even servants, right? So I would assume that would just mean the actual, the, the Jehovah who was with the Father to create the world, that second person in the us and in the our who created man. Okay, and so what is remarkable then about Colossians 2.9 or, or what's being said by Paul to the church in Colossae if he's essentially saying Jesus is Jesus. Well, I think we both know that oftentimes, like to, to discern Paul's writings, you have to figure out who he's writing to, yep. what they exactly believed in, and what the context of his letter is. So 
Unfortunately, I don't have all that scholarship in front of me, so I, I, won't, I won't make a statement of this is exactly what he's referring to, but it is quite possible that he's, he's speaking to a presupposition they already have. So do you believe that they were believers? The church in Colossae, they were believers? Yes. And so what do you think there was anything remarkable about the theatetos, the deity dwelling in bodily form? Do you think there's anything remarkable about the deity being in bodily form? Yes. I, God became a person. I think that's remarkable. But um, wouldn't they have known that if they had known the Father from your worldview, that isn't God a person, God the Father, in bodily form already? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very I'm confused on what did, you're... Did the Colossians not believe that the Father had a body? The, I, I, the, the original saints believed that God had a body. So yes. what's so remarkable about Jesus having a body? Because... It's finally the fulfillment. It is the that the Messiah has come and atoned for their sins. That's what's remarkable about it, that God has come as a man to atone for your sins. I think that's remarkable. Okay. Um, you said that the problem with the word eternal is that we cannot define it. So what does God intend for us to understand from Scripture when he calls himself eternal? So, I, I mean, again, it's, 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 it's words to create an idea of who you should worship, right? So... Um, the term, a term also used for Christ is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. But obviously, we don't believe Christ is going to have an end. So these, again, these are, these are terms that we cannot define, but they illustrate enough of a purpose that we can understand who is talking and the authority that they have. So you don't have any kind of definition for eternal that is intended by the authors? You, you, it's, it's, I mean, it's quite literally too impossible to define eternal. So, to give an exhaustive de definition to use the terms you used. Okay. Um, I'll use one of your scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants, 76. says, from eternity to eternity, God is the same. Right. What, what's meant by that? The exact same thing I said. It is, it, it, these are terms that are uh, beautiful terms to illustrate power and authority. But again, to define eternity, I would just say has always been. And if I had to define that, I would be hard-pressed, right? Again, th these, these, these words are, are pur purposely created to be words you cannot define. Like, that, that's the point of them. So the purpose is just to confuse people enough to say, well, God is just confusing? No, I didn't say that. That's, okay. Um, is it true that in your worldview the Holy Ghost can be called God? I've never, ever heard a Latter-day Saint call the Holy, Ho Holy Ghost God. Is he a member of the Godhead? Yes. He's a, he is a God, but when we say God, we almost always refer to the Father and sometimes refer to the Son. Is the Holy Ghost omnipresent? No. Can a human... Well, well I guess that, that would... What are you, how are you defining omnipresent? Well, uh, can a human being receive the Holy Ghost as a constant personal companion in your worldview? Right. So when we, when we say terms like the Holy Ghost should be with you and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost... What we actually mean, and, and this is pretty clearly laid out in, in church scholarship and, and in church literature, that it means the influence of the Holy Spirit. So the way the Holy Spirit works is the Holy Spirit is it has a spirit body, but his spirit influences our spirit, and that's how we are guided by the spirit. But he's not literally standing next to me when I feel the spirit. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's a poetic So you use, can't yeah. receive him as a personal companion, just you, as influence. You, you receive yeah, the personal influence. You, that's the companionship you receive, the personal influence of the Holy Spirit. But it's the same as with if, if um, my mother says, I'm, I, you know, I'm always here for you, I'm always with you. It doesn't actually mean she's literally in Utah. Okay. What was the meaning then in Joseph Smith's prayer for the, over the Kirtland Temple in DNC 109? He says, uh, he prays that they would receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost. What did he mean by fullness of the Holy Ghost? So that... Uh, the fullness of the Holy Ghost, one, that, there's a couple different definitions you could use for that, but I would assume that context is being given the gift of the Holy Ghost, and use, the fullness of the Holy Ghost is being ordained, being confirmed a member of the actual church, and having that influence always with you. Okay, um, in D&C 130, it says the Holy Ghost does not have body or parts. If it were not so, he could not dwell in us. What does dwell in us mean? So dwell in us. Uh, well, so it's this is but this is part of the doctrine and covenants that you sort of have to take with um, a really important lens because the doctrine and covenants also states that um, it is a 
sort of a, a sectarian notion that the Holy Ghost is always literally with us. So it kind of give, it gives both, right? Joseph Smith was clear about both things, that it's a sectarian notion, falsehood that the Holy Ghost is literally in your heart. But when you say the Holy Ghost dwells in your heart, again, that's a poetic description. So, I mean, if you're, if you're, when you're trying to analyze scripture and divinity, you're going to get mostly those things. For even what you stated when I asked you to define transcendent, you were using terms like, you know, uh, uh, perfect and powerful and, and, and you know, uh, these, these very beautiful, worshipful words. These are words that are hard to define. These are words that don't give an exact, clear definition, but they are words that get the point across. So in the Doctrine and Covenants, we use these terms just as they're used in the Bible and other scriptures. In Psalm 139, who is listed as being present in more places than one at a time? I believe you're referring to the Holy Ghost. Okay, so is it true that the Holy Ghost, as a person, can be present in more than one place at a time? His influence can. It says in Psalm 139.7, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? You don't think there's an e equation there between the spirit of God and the actual real presence of God, not just his influence? Well, again, I mean, the... the Okay. Um, the, I mean, the president of the United States could say that, you know, you, you cannot flee away from my authority if he's trying to find you, right? Again, these, are, like, these terms are terms that are open-ended. Um, besides, if, if, if that was literally true in the way you're implying, that would mean he is within time and space. Correct. He's imminent. Like I've made clear in my statements, he's transcendent and imminent. So when it says, if I go to Sheol, you are there. If I ascend on the heavens, you are there. That's not what it means? Um, well, I'll, oh, is that time? Okay. Well, obviously, right. So if I, if, if I go and commit a crime, I know that God is watching. God is there. I can't escape his influence because he's the creator of all things. However, if I commit a crime, it doesn't mean that I'm going to, like, that Elohim, God the Father, is quite literally there. These are poeticisms. These are words we use to describe, one, an emotional feeling of he can, if he goes to Sheol, he knows God is there because he, he has a knowledge and, and doctrine of God with him, convicting him at all times. Okay, quick, we now have 10 minutes to cross-examine Jeremy. Um, early, you, you stated that you, don't, you wouldn't use the word part to describe Christ. Um, or the ghost of the Father in the Trinity, but you were comfortable with the term person and you were comfortable with the numbering of them, one, two, three. Yep. Um, when you, how many books are on that table right now? Uh, there are several. Uh, I'll just throw a number 10. Okay, there are 10 books Give on the take. table. Yeah. Um, how many, this, this, this Joseph Smith book you have up there, can yep. you count how many pages are in that book if you wanted to? Yes. Um, is a page a part of a book? Yes, it is. So when you, if you're counting separate things within something, are you counting parts? You certainly are um, in this material universe, absolutely. Would you not apply the same standard to counting, let's say, three beings that may exist outside of our world? Uh, sure, if we're counting aliens on Mars and there are three of them sitting there, uh, sure, we can go one, two, three, yep. Well, that, that's lunacy, because aliens are only on Jupiter, but the point is, uh, <laughs> um, if you were to, is it, is it unfair if someone's, is it fair for someone to count three within the Trinity? Is it, un, is it is, fair? Is it fair, sorry. Is it fair for someone to count three within the Trinity? Three persons, absolutely, yes. And three distinct, like to make distinctions between one and the other? Yes, they have different roles and functions as um, revealed in Scripture, yes. So if you can make distinctions and you can count those distinctions, why is the word part not a fair word to use? Because that would mean on their own, each would only be a third of God or a certain percentage of God, and coming together, they would equal the full essence of God. Whereas in Scripture, we see that each person retains the full deity of the one true God. So if someone were to say that Jesus is the, is the second person of the triune God, 
he was, he's also the encompassing three. He's also fully God. Is what no, no uh, each person is distinct from the other two. He could never be, uh, one person could never be all three persons. So that's, that doesn't mean division. There, there's no division there of the counting of the three? There's no dividing the substance, as you've read from the Athanasian Creed and maybe a couple of your videos. Um, it's very clear in Christian doctrine, orthodoxy from Scripture states that you cannot divide the substance of God. There is eternally only one God. We are monotheistic. So, the, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of beat this dead horse for a while, sure. but I just want to be clear, you, you, you do believe that you can count the three and you can make distinctions between the three, but you do not believe you can divide them. Well, I don't know what you mean by you divide. You, you can't can divide each person, no. Um, but there are three distinct persons. You can't take one person and then divide him. He is a, he is a person in, of, in and of himself. He has a personality in and of himself. Okay. Um, if I were to take a piece of paper right now, and I were to draw two lines, making three parts, or three countings. Are you, well, if, if I were to rip one, would that be a part of the paper? Rip one off, would that be a part of the paper? Yes, and if you are attempting to compare the eternally unchanging immaterial God to a piece of paper, you are in a worse shape than I ever thought you would have been. <laughs> well, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is I, I want you to really like press this down, that I'm, I, I am counting three, therefore by by the way, math works. I'm also dividing, right? In any, in any term, in anything I would discern in this world, it would work that in way. And regarding the persons of the Godhead, there are three. Yes. Okay, but you just you do you believe the rules are different when it comes to discerning God? That that you what can't rules? use it? the the rules, rules that you, of you math. believe are uncertain and uh, can change. The rules, the rules of math, the rules of logic, right? These but laws those, of logic. But those are uncertain, and I, so why would you even be using those as a statement? I am asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works. Very good point. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so God is utterly unique. And if we are going to try to drag his nature down into the slop that has fallen man, we are going to be doing a disservice to ourselves, but ultimately to him who will judge the living and the dead. Is language part of the, uh, the, the way languages work? Is that, is that part of the fallen man? No, communication is, uh, it existed before the fall of man, and it's part of what makes the image of God the image of God, that we can reason and have discourse. What about the alphabet? What about the alphabet? Is, is the alphabet a, a product of the fallen man? Well, the English alphabet came after the fall, but, but no. I mean, um, communication, generally speaking, um, is the way God designed us as beings who are made in his image. No, no, but I mean, specifically speaking, um, is, is the English alphabet a product of the fallen man? There is nothing sinful inherently about the English language. I no, no, I, 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 I'm not saying there is. Um, but we, it, it is a product of the fallen man, right? Fallen sinful people did create the English alphabet. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, God created language, and God uh, gave lots of languages in Genesis 11. Um, English wasn't one of them. Uh, right, but right. we're a great, 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 great grandchild of one of those languages. This isn't a gotcha question. I just try to set a foundation, right? Sure, like, I've we, never we, been asked a question like that, so I'm just doing my best to work through it. Um, to transcribe God's word, God's truth, into English, would that be, by your standard, bringing down um, an, an eternal perfect being into the sloths of man. As long as we're being faithful to the inspired original text, absolutely not. And what if there are, okay, um, are there any mistakes in the current Bible that you have? The New American Standard Bible that I, I preach from is not the original inspired text, no. So if the Bible you're, the Bible you're using is not the original inspired text, is it fair, then fair to say that we have brought God down to the faulty, folly definitions and creations of man? I think we're getting a little far afield here, but, um, but no. I, I mean, the reason I use the New American Standard Bible is because I believe, in, as far as English translations go, it's one of the most faithful to the uh, textual tradition that we have. Um, you said you were, used the word, use the word believe. You believe it is the most faithful. Yep. Do you know that it is the most faithful? I am not omniscient, and uh, so when it comes to judging Bible translations, um, 
I can't make a definitive statement like God would be able to. It, then is it out of the ordinary, or, out, or rather, is it unfair if someone were to make the statement that, be, that the faulty Bible we have, um, the Bible that most Americans use, some um, offshoot of translation of KJV or ESV is imperfect? Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. Any, any text that is not the original is going to have some sort of imperfection in it. Um, in, in grammar, punctuation, um, a misquoted uh, verse uh, right, from right. memory or inserting something that isn't supposed to be there, sure. Would you then say that it's fair, is it fair to say that the truth of God um, has been put into an imperfect book? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe so, um, no. And I don't know what this has to do with if God is immaterial or not, but no. I oh, it, it, it's getting there. Okay. Is God, okay, well, I, I phrase this correctly. God is perfect. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Um, is, the, is the Bible we have, not the original text, but the Bible that you and I use, are those perfect? In the sense that, in what sense? It clarify. Are, are, they, are they perfect in, any, in every possible way? No. Um, does that then mean that the truth of God that has been revealed, being put into an imperfect book, would that fall under the, the, a, a tradition of bringing God down to a faulty level of man's understanding? No. God, so God has been faithful through the transmission of the text over the centuries to retain the, the Word of God in the pages that we have. So when we open it and read it, we can know for certain that God, through His eternal Spirit, is using it to communicate to us, reveal His nature to us, convict us of sin, and lead us to faith in Christ. Uh, this isn't a debate over the transmission of the text, and so I don't know what this has to do with God being immaterial or not. Um, is Is there, it, 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 do, you, do you find any contradiction between God, God being faithful in the transmission completely in giving us a text that is reliable and also the text being, or the Bible we have right now being faulty and imperfect? Do you see a contradiction of, of a perfectly inspired um, uh, transmission process leading to an imperfect book? No, because God never promised that there would only be perfect copies made of the original inspired uh, version of the text. Is there anywhere in the text that God had that God said he would inspire the transmission process? Is there anywhere that's clearly explicitly written out? God never said that every single copy would be perfect in every single way, grammar included. No. Um, are there any Bibles around right now today that are... Can, can we, let's, let's have him finish this one and we'll do this. That are, um, perf are, are perfect to the original text of the authors. We do not have the original text of the authors. Uh, therefore, we are unable to judge it perfectly against that standard that you've created. Thank you. Each speaker will now have five minutes to give a closing statement. Kwaku will go first. What you saw presented tonight were two worldviews. Um, you, saw, you saw one presentation outlining what the reality of a material God gives and what the reality of an immaterial God gives. You saw one presentation using church father quotes and scriptures and reason to outline what God would be by his own definitions and by logic. You saw another presentation using presuppositions that just hold that God has to be triune and material. We were not given any definitions of immaterial. We were not given any definitions of transcendent. I think each person here is going to go home and probably think about this. Um, it's my hope and prayer that when you do that, you can get a conviction that you feel is the strongest. Each one of us here is eventually going to die and is going to have to face God. And when I say face God, I mean that. It's going to have to face God and look at him. And when that happens, you're going to have to, I'll say, I'll, I'll say this out of respect. When that happens, each and every one of us is going to, one, know his love and feel his presence and authority. And we're going to understand him better then than we do now. I believe it was Mark Twain who said that if you could really interview and examine one person fully, you'd find that every person worships a different God because 
our brains are incredibly complex and we each have pres presuppositions and assumptions that are different than one another. But if we come unto what is the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of clarity, the gospel of truth and knowledge, if we come unto that gospel, we know who our Father is, we know who we're, where we're going, and we know who we're becoming. If we stick with the traditions of the world and the traditions of, of scholasticism and, and, and uh, false empires and, and all of these things, we're going to get complex theologies, and one day you're going to have to realize that you don't have a relationship with that you don't understand. That you don't have a relationship with that which is incomprehensible and impossible. And because of that, I invite each and every one of you to truly think through everything you've been taught, to truly think through everything that the, that's written in the scriptures, whether it be the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Quran, to, to think through them and not take anyone else's word for it, but read it with your own mind and pray and get a clarity and understanding. I would also like to thank you all for being here um, as with your physical bodies, using your physical eyes, looking at a physical man and seeing that materiality is the way to discern truth and understanding. Jeremy now has five minutes to give his closing statement. Yeah, I do want to thank you for being here this evening. It's cool to see a packed house. Um, I hope you listened for authority, as I encourage you to do at the beginning. Uh, Quaker just encouraged you to do some things and to think about some things. But why listen to him? He could be wrong about everything he believes, according to his own words. The scriptures themselves are God's revelation to us. God has revealed himself as the only transcendent being. He is the only one, utterly unique, who exists outside of time and space and matter. If he didn't, he would be a creature like the rest of us. Yet God has made himself known. He is the imminent one who can save. He is not a God far off. He is a God who is near. He fills both heaven and earth. Who is the God that can save? Can a God who is just like you save you from your sins? He cannot. We need God himself to save us by entering into a fallen world, by taking on flesh and living a perfect life, dying the death that we deserve for our sins, our willful rebellion against him, and rising again that we might not trust in our own works anymore, but trust in His works alone. And He has done that in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it is at Jesus' feet that we should bow, that we should kiss the Son, as Psalm 2 encourages us to do, that we should bend the knee. That's what that word worship means, bend the knee. And when you do so, are you bending the knee to a God who is just like you? That God cannot save but you approach the God who inhabits eternity, who dwells in complete holiness, and on the merits of Christ alone, you can be accepted. If you reject your own efforts and embrace the finished efforts of Jesus Christ, your whole life will be changed. You'll be given a new nature. You'll be a new creature. And you can have eternal life through faith alone. The one who has life in himself is the one who can save. The one who has life that was given to him from another has no more power to save your soul than you do. Trust in Jesus Christ, the one true God. Thanks. For the question and answer period, audience members are invited to line up at the microphone and ask a question to one of the speakers. Please state which speaker you would like to answer the question. The speaker being asked the question will have two minutes to give an answer and his opponent will have one minute to offer a rebuttal before we move on to the next question. All questions should be related to the topic of the debate. And remember to state who the question's for, so we don't vote. Should, should we stand up for this? Should we be a little more like... Uh, Presidential, like yeah. a town hall? <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> it's okay if I have a question, one for each. Yeah, it's fine. My first question is for Quaker. In DNC 130, uh, 22, it stated that the Father has a body of flesh and bone. Right? And so Jesus says in John chapter 4 that God is spirit. And then after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24, he says a spirit does not have flesh and bone. So when Jesus says a spirit does not have flesh and bone, and then he says God is spirit, how is that the same as DNC saying God is spirit? So we explicitly believe that 
spirit does not have flesh and bone. So when we say spirit body, it's, it's pretty clearly defined as a body of spirit in the shape of a man. However, we don't actually believe that a spirit has flesh and bone. So you believe that God is spirit in this? Well, God is also love and God is also light, right? But he's not only spirit. He's not only love. He's not only light. So if that's the fullness of a statement, just to put in my one minute rebuttal, um, this is just one of, the, one of the problems that we have when we don't uh, listen to or study any type of exegetical resources um, that, that are provided for us for Scripture. Um, I mean, I have a, a feeling that if we were to get into the acopulative, qualitative, and arthurist predicate nominative of John 4.24, then um, we would all be uh, kind of in over our heads. But there are resources out there that explain in the Greek what Jesus was saying. And when Jesus told the woman of the, at the well that God is a spirit, he did not mean matter. Before I get to my question for you. We got to go quick. We got a line behind The second one is in Isaiah 43.10. It says, before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. So no God will be formed after Jehovah. This is Jehovah in this passage. How will you someday be a God? God says there will never be a God after him. So um, almost all Christians, when you get down to it, still believe in deification, right? So um, if, when I say I'm going to become a god, is, I don't believe that I'm going to be in the same place my heavenly father is. It means I'm going to become exalted, right? So Elohim in Hebrew um, can be used to define God, angels, spirits, a number of things. Um, so when you say there's no god performed after me, one, you have to really define what exactly you're speaking about, but two, you also have to take in the ancient context of that language being used in Egyptian hymns and in Assyrian hymns and poems saying things about Amun-Ra, that there's no god like Amun-Ra, he is unique. Um, uh, things like that are, are pretty common in the ancient world, and so when you examine it in its context, it seems to be ancient language used to elevate as opposed to a sole declaration of what is in heaven, because as we know, these early church fathers and the saints of the Bible believed that you could become a god. Yeah, that is, I think I can speak on behalf of all Christians in the room uh, that we do not believe in the deification of man as uh, Mormons believe uh, in any sense. And um, uh, furthermore, in Isaiah 43, the verse you quoted, that was not the way Isaiah understood it. That's not the way his audience understood it. And, understood it. and it's certainly not the way that God uh, had them to understand it. So. Okay. Do you have time for your question or not? Hurry up. There we go. Daniel chapter 7, do you believe that the Father is the Ancient of Days? Yes, in Daniel 7, the Father's the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man is Christ, yes. If God wanted, could he show himself as a male figure who has hair that's white as snow? There are multiple theophanies, is the theological word, um, in the Old Testament where God has revealed himself in a way that man can understand him. It's part of the imminence of God that God would reveal himself in such a way. Um, so in that sense, yes. And you, if you want to... Uh, yeah, we're, let's get to yeah. this okay. next sister. Sorry. We'll get figured out eventually. Okay, so this is for Jeremy. Um, you had said that God doesn't share his glory, but yet he shares his glory with Jesus who yeah. is a man. Why is it then that we as men and women also can't share in that glory if Jesus was a man? Why is it that we can't? Correct. Um, it's because... Jesus is God and we are not. And even in his, uh, when Jesus took on flesh, he retained full deity. Um, the verse I was quoting, Isaiah 42, 8, um, just to read it in its uh, fullness. I am the Lord, uh, the word Yahweh being used there, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. And essential to understanding this is the name of Yahweh. And God the Father is identified by the name Yahweh, God the Son is identified by the name Yahweh, and God the Holy Spirit is identified uh, with Yahweh throughout the scriptures. And so there is a, an aspect by which all three persons share in the same glory, they retain the same deity, because there is but one Yahweh. Um, do I? And we're not him, I should add. So, again, I think that that's... that's removing the context of what the scriptures say and, and really pigeonholing the scriptures and not looking at the full context because Revelation 3.21, the Lord promises us, to, whom, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with the Father in his throne. 
um, there's a number of things. Where, uh, in Second Peter 1, 4, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I mean, it, the, the scriptures are very, very clear, even Romans 8, right? That we will um, be joint heirs with Christ. So it's pretty clear. Once, if you take that all away, you have, you have nothing. You, you get to heaven, you don't know what heaven is. You don't have anything to do in heaven. You just die and you go there. there. There's no point to any of this. Deification and becoming what you're supposed to be is the whole point we exist. Yes, Christ saved us from hell, but he saved us for glory. Hello, you two. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to try to fly through this. I just want to say thank you so much for doing this because it's amazing to see two people with completely different ideologies, worldviews, interacting and engaging each other in a way that's not a total dumpster fire, no, that's good. especially given how the world is going right now. So this is very encouraging. But to get to my point why I'm up here is I'd like to get uh, Kwaku's response and then um, yours. So I wanted to take a crack at uh, your original challenge to bring up something that is... Anything immaterial that is an idea that is not an idea. Anything immaterial that is not an idea. And so I think an idea is something that comes from us. It's something that is uh, something that we come up with. An abstract or immaterial object like uh, Mandelbrot sets, laws of logic, laws of nature, numbers, uh, your consciousness. These exist independent of our like uh, we discover them is what I'm saying. So you don't come up with an idea for a Mandelbrot set. It exists outside of our existence, really. So it's something that we discover. And uh, you know, it, as far as immaterial objects interacting with material objects, we have the laws of logic, we have the laws of nature, we have mathematical realities, numbers, and even our consciousness. If our consciousness is immaterial, that's something that's personal. So that's kind of what was going through my head. I would like to get your thoughts, and then if you have anything to follow up with that, that would be wonderful. Right, so um, I don't think ideas only come from man. I think ideas are things that are recognized that exist. So for example, an idea just came from me, then it'd be something I invented. I, I had this idea, but usually ideas are in the philosophical world, things that are recognized, but they have to be recognized by physical, material things. So when I say outside of us, if you take away human beings, you take away our physical brains and the, the chemicals and the organs that make them work, you have no one to detect um, the laws of logic. You have no one to understand or expound upon. So you, that's where you get Parley P. Pratt's conclusion of nothingness. Without materiality, there can be no recognition of that which is immaterial. Yeah, so um, one of the things that Kwaku has said that I quoted earlier, he said, if all of us were to die, all of our ideas would die. There would not be ideas because ideas come from human beings. And there is a very massive fundamental distinction between this category he is uh, posited of ideas that come from humans and eternally unchanging immaterial realities that exist because of the eternally unchanging immaterial God. And so if we separate those, those two categories where you have a transcendent being and then you have immaterial abstractions that are eternally true regardless of hum human, humanity's existence, one has to come from the other. And the transcendent being is the, the one who exists for all eternity in part and parcel to his nature and our understanding of reality are all these abstractions that flow from his existence. Hi. Um, so you guys talked about the eternal nature of God and who he is a little bit, but you also mentioned our spirit and our soul and who we are, and I was wondering if you both could answer, when did that start, our soul and who we are? So... The soul is the body and spirit combined. So your soul begins when you were born. Your spirit existed before uh, this world in heaven, created out of the intelligence of the universe, and your soul is a culmination of your spirit and body together. 
So, yeah, the, the soul, which I referenced at the beginning of the debate, the nephesh, the Greek or the Hebrew word uh, for our immaterial existence, it starts in Genesis 2 7 when God breathes life into man. So, it's something that God does as a creative act on earth, uh, creating man. He, he creates a soul. Um, Psalm 139 tells us that God knits together in the womb. And uh, though there are places in Scripture where it talks about God's foreknowledge, uh, not just God foreknowing all things, but God foreknowing persons, we see uh, only a one-way knowledge in Scripture. God knew Jeremiah before the womb and set him apart. God foreknew his elect before they were even born. But there is no hint of a pre-existence in which we knew God. Um, we began whenever we were conceived. And for more information on that, I can highly recommend Created in God's Image by Anthony Hokema. Uh, this is a great resource on that subject. Hi, this message, this uh, question is for Kwaku. Um, so, as was brought up before, Isaiah 43.10, as it says, that no, gar no God shall be formed. No God was formed not only after, but before. He also says in Isaiah 44.6, is there any other God? I know not one. And also in Moroni 8.18, in the Book of Mormon, it says that God is eternally unchanging. So in that retrospect, if he was to become man, that would change form. If he was to do those things or be exalted, that would be a changing act. So is God a liar, or is he truly unchanging and immaterial? So again, in, in the context of the Old Testament, you have to read it with the ancient Near Eastern context. So the Bible also says there are no other cities besides well, it essentially says, it, it says there's no cities besides Nineveh. Um, and and uh, I mean, it, 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 this, is, this is language you use to elevate either how wicked that city was or how powerful God is. Um, the Egyptian pharaohs did it. They did it with their gods, and they were clearly polytheistic. Um, uh, the great Cairo hymn, the Amun Ra, says that quite a bit. So again, I don't think it's that persuasive of an argument in its actual context. To say that God has never changed... Um, you have to figure out what they mean by that. You can't say God has never changed as in he's always just been one exact way, like he's never given new revelation. Uh, uh, even even uh, people um, like uh, my lovely friend James White, who uh, says, you know, pretty clearly that the doctrine of the Trinity, yeah, it's, it's a, the doctrine of the Trinity um, is, is revealed at a certain part in the New Testament, and that's about it. So there's obviously changes. If the world changes and things happen and God is the God of the world, there's going to be changes that happen, but it means his nature, his authority will always be there. That doesn't change, but he is, as a person, well, he's got to give new information. He's got to speak to new people. Changes have to happen. That's just the way the world is. That's the way everything works. So uh, one of the major problems in Mormon theology is there was a historic evolution of it. Um, starting in the Book of Mormon and through the life of Joseph Smith, it was changing. And when it comes to a verse like Moroni 8.18, we are unable to do a word study in Reformed Egyptian to find out what eternity means. And so um, that really limits the Latter-day Saint to how he can explain verses like that. And uh, I think you just heard something that makes no sense. Hello, thank you. Um, this is a question from earlier, uh, pastor asked you, Kwaku, is there any distinction between uh, man and God? And th th you guys were talking about how, well, God cannot lie, it's, nor it's part of his nature. Um, and then, so my question is, if it's the same uh, God the Father that we're talking about, how is it that one account in Genesis and one account in Abraham could be totally different? The question is this. Uh, Abraham, the book of Abraham in chapter 2, verse 24 says, Let her say unto the Egyptians, She is thy sister, and thy soul shall live, as God the Father is telling Abraham to lie. We see in Genesis it says, And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. How can that be the same God, a holy God, that would tell Abraham to lie? Right, so that's a pretty pointed question, and I don't know if I agree with your assumption that it's God telling them to lie. But I think we can say this, um, if you don't believe that it's, it's the same God in uh, the Bible and the Pearl of Great Price, I mean, I'm not here to convince you of that, right? If you don't believe that, you don't believe that. That's not, that's not 
you're saying that, that there is a difference that the I disagree with God, your assumption that he's saying he, that she should lie. Well, no, what was said was, is there any distinction between man and God? And you answered saying that he cannot lie, nor is that part of his nature. So part of his nature would be when he instructed anybody to lie, correct? Yeah, I think I disagree with your conclusion that he's instructing people to lie. Okay, did I misread the text in the, in the book of Abraham, chapter 2? I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't, I just, I don't agree with your conclusion. I don't think we have time to go back and forth about <laughs> the book of Abraham here, though. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, thank you both for this very interesting discussion and debate. My question is for Pastor Jeremy. Okay. Uh, you focused a lot on Romans 4.17. Sure. Uh, Ectus me ontos, out of nothing as you rendered it. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on something uh, uh, about that language specifically. Okay. So that language is Aristotelian. Uh, it's used by Aristotle in his On the Generation of Animals to describe the process of birth. When he says, and I'll quote, for birth is from non-existence, ectu me ontos, uses the exact same phrase that Paul uses in Romans, into being and corruption back into meontos. So if the first century conception of this verbiage in Greek was relative non-being as opposed to absolute non-being, then why should we assume that Paul was using it to describe absolute non-being as opposed to relative non-being, like in the process of birth, for example, which is the example Aristotle uses. At one point, your children are nothing but then they become something. Well, they don't just poof into existence out of nothing, right? So why, why should we make this distinction with how it's being used in Paul's day with how Paul uses it himself as you interpret it? Sure. Um, thank you for the very thorough, uh, intense, intensely intellectual question. Um, the, uh, there, is a, there is a parallel going on there when it talks about God calling into existence. We're talking about the God of Israel. And it was understood by the, God, by the Israelites that their God called into being that which is. From the Genesis account, God said, let there be light. He calls into being that which does not exist. And so um, do I believe that the uh, believers that were in the church of Rome were um, you know, thinking through an Aristotelian lens whenever they uh, received this, this letter from Paul? I, I believe they were thinking in the context of the old covenant God who created all things. And there's a parallel going on with um, God's authority because of his transcendence over all matter and what he did in the life of Abraham. Um, but more importantly, the basis of uh, Abraham's faith and confidence was this God who is not contingent on matter, but the God who calls all matter into being. If I may ask a follow-up question, um, since you mentioned Genesis chapter 1, the creation of Genesis 1, which really wasn't discussed that much in the debate here, right. which I think is very important. Um, we've known since at least the 11th century with Rashi's analysis of the Hebrew grammar that Genesis 1, 1 and 2 is a temporal relative clause, not an absolute clause. In other words, again, it's when God began creating that which was tohu vavohu, formless and void, he said, let there be light. So since the, mid the Middle Ages, Jewish and Christian exegetes have recognized something existing in Genesis 1, 1 and not being created out of nothing. I'm curious if you can give any thought on that, since uh, I think you're right, they probably are thinking in an Israelite conception, but the Israelite conception, I think it's very clear, is relative non-being, not absolute non-being in terms of creation. Yeah, again, uh, I would go to passages like Psalm 96.5 that distinguishes God from any other uh, God or any other theory put forth by man, that the gods of men are idols, but Yahweh made the heavens, is what it says. and. Um, yeah, tohu abohu, formless and void. Why was it formless and void? Why was it even there in the first place? Well, because of God's thelema in, in Revelation 4.11. By God's will, it was. And so how did it get there? Um, it's the chicken or the egg, right? Um, is matter self-existent or is God? Well, God has life in and of himself. And uh, it, it was there by his will. Yep, thank you. So in, in Acts 7, as Stephen Who's is Who's the question for? This is for Pastor Jeremy, sorry. Oh, okay, all right. In Acts 7, as Stephen is being stoned, he says he, well, it's written, he's filled with the Holy Ghost and looks up to heaven and sees God and Jesus, the Son, standing on the right hand of God. So if the Father uh, is not of the same material as the Son in, in a corporal sense, 
uh, what exactly is the ontological difference between the Father and the Holy Ghost? Right, yeah, so in the Acts 7 account where Stephen sees uh, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, um, we shouldn't look upon the frame of man and then from that define the frame of God and ascribe God's frame based on man's frame. Um, and, and we need to remember that it's said that God's throne is heaven and, and earth is his footstool. It's absolutely critical to understand um, that when Stephen says he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. His point isn't to limit God's being, but his point is to expand our view of God. His point isn't to say um, there are two beings who look just like us. <laughs> his point is to say that Jesus is high and lifted up, and he's in a place of privilege and honor and glory with the Father. It doesn't say he saw the Father. He sees Jesus at the right hand of God. He sees Jesus in a privileged position, as was being said. Uh, before Jesus incarnated, he was seated on a throne. Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah saw Jesus in glory before he ever incarnated. And so being on a throne doesn't imply a body. It doesn't imply a body of flesh and... and like, if I, like if I can give a reply to that as well before yes. a follow-up. I think, again, this is, we've seen this throughout the whole debate tonight. Image doesn't mean image. Father doesn't mean father. Right hand of doesn't mean right hand of. The scriptures are clear. When, he, when, when Stephen's being stoned, it's not that he's, he's looking up and that means oh, I saw the right, Jesus at the right hand of God. That sh you should read that as, it means that they're incredibly high. No, it means his mission was fulfilled and they came to him at the time of his death at his martyrdom to welcome him in. He's seeing them and that's a glorious occasion. But he, lit, he saw it. It's the right hand of God. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He sees two people. And I just think that once you remove that away because you have to bring up this sort of um, Middle Ages European revisionist history and put forth an immaterialism, you, nothing means any, like nothing, it, nothing has a solid definition anymore. You read everything and you go, well, it doesn't really mean that. And well, they don't really mean that. No, I think it's pretty clear. And I think we should rejoice in that because we'll be there too one day. To, to take back the 20 seconds that was robbed from me. Uh, <laughs> Steve, well, we're, we're allowed to. Rep there, there's. I wasn't done. To, I got cut oh, off. I um, totally. So uh, Stephen, when he was seeing Jesus, wasn't declaring the statement he declared to say, "Hey, look how awesome I am! They're welcoming me home." He was pointing to the awesome glory of Jesus Christ. So my my follow up, kind of tagalog is, what exactly is the the ontological and I guess the purpose, uh, as far as the difference between the Father and the the Spirit go. The ontological difference? Ontological as well as what function they have. Well, ontologically, they are, they are both God. Uh, both persons are God. There is no distinction ontologically. Um, functionally, however, we see in salvation, we see um, through a, different ways that we interact with God, that they, that they all have a distinct role. There's a, a functional subordination that happens within the Trinity um, where Jesus says to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. And, and in salvation, the Father didn't die on a cross for us, but the Son died on a cross for us. And the Father doesn't uh, regenerate us, but the Holy Spirit regenerates us. And so there's all kinds of distinction there, and that's called the economical trinity, or the economic trinity, not the ontological trinity. And the ontological trinity, talking about the nature of being, there is but one God, but economically or functionally, they do have different roles. How much um, time do we, moderator, how much time do we have left? I'll how make long? it short. Um, okay. I'm happy I'm able to make it. This is my first week out in Utah, and I'm happy that you guys were hosting this debate. Welcome. Welcome um, to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is for Kwaku. It's slightly off topic. It's about the resurrection. Um, so in John 6, 39 to 40, and also, and I believe it's John 14. So in John 6, 39, 40, Jesus is talking about the Father's will regarding the resurrection. And he says that no man, like every single Christian, won't be resurrected until the last day as a uh, single day. And in Jesus' statement, he says that, I go prepare a place for you, and when I come back, um, when I come back for you, then you'll be with me. So my question for Kwaku is, uh, what basis um, is there for uh, Peter, James, and John as resurrected beings to give Joseph Smith priesthood. Right, so um, 
e even if you remove the, uh, the Latter-day Saint theology, there's still this sort of, I guess, loophole in the Bible, right? So uh, many pastors and theologians sort of expound upon what, who they think the two prophets slain in Jerusalem will be. And a non-Mormon guess of that is perhaps it's, it's uh, Elijah or Enoch, right? These people that were translated up to heaven. So even removing Mormonism, there's still this, this precedent for certain people becoming uh, translated beings in heaven that have not died yet. And so because of that, I just think we live with the reality that certain people God translated up to heaven and can come back down. Okay, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with some of the history, but didn't Joseph Smith say they were resurrected rather than translated? Um, yeah, yeah you, you'd have to bring me the, the quotes you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Pastor Jeremy. So it seems that one of the premises that you're going off of, I guess, is for why God needs to be immaterial, is that he can exist outside of time and space. Um, I don't pretend to represent all of Latter-day Saint theology. Sure. Obviously, I'm only representing myself, but... You weren't sent by the First Presidency? Uh, yeah, <laughs> weirdly enough. Um, no, so, um, yeah, that's right. So, so, like I said, this is really just my view, um, but my understanding is just that basically God is so advanced in his understanding that whether he actually exists outside of, like, time and space or he has just become so knowledgeable that he can circumvent time and space, he can still function that way even if he is material. So like the only other conflict that I see your view of God having with the materiality of God uh, is that you believe that he, it's important to understand that he existed, he predates matter, um, because you believe in the ex nihilo um, sure. theory of creation. But that, my question is, why do you assert that that's the, the theory that the Bible supports when it wasn't even supported until Basilides came around a full century after uh, the, the coming of or the birth of Christ, it seemed he was the first one to assert that point. Sure. Um, well, Job is typically referred to and understood as the first book of the Bible. And if you read God's questioning of Job, starting in Job 38 uh, through basically the end of the book, um, you see that as God has revealed Himself, He has always revealed Himself as the self-existent One. Uh, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth, and when I did this, and when I did that? Uh, God is the one who has always existed. He did not uh, come from matter as we did. Um, he is not bound by, this, by the laws of nature. That's why God can do miracles, is because He exists outside of uh, material. And so, uh, in the beginning, God. That's why you can have that opening phrase with no qualifications, is because God has always been understood by those who have received His revelation as one who is self-existent, who has an eternal existence that's unchanging and immaterial. Hey, Kwaku. Hi, Aaron. Good to see you. <laughs> Earlier in this debate, you said that one of the differences between us and God is that we don't know the future. Um, is it not true that elsewhere you have intimated that God himself doesn't exhaustively know the definite future? Uh, haven't you uh, given a favorable nod toward, toward open theism, the position that God doesn't know the future? I'll restate it. Do you believe that God knows exhaustively the definite and certain future of what will come to pass? Um, I don't know. I've, I've given, uh, I've sort of gotten my hands wet in both categories of if he does know the future, and does that mean he knows every possible outcome to, uh, what's, that, what's that, that superhero movie, the, 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 the guy with the cape? What? Okay, you know that scene? I'm not a good nerd, but you know that scene where he's, he's like, every possible outcome? Um, that, that is one actual proposed theory, that God knows every possible outcome and leaves it up to you to decide which one you're going to pick, right? Um, so I haven't c firmly made up my mind on that. I've sort of said both and opened it to conversation and discussion. Okay, so the earlier idea that we're different from God and that we don't know the future sounds like you're perhaps open to the idea that we're uh, much like God in that we perhaps don't know the future, that God is like us and that he doesn't know what will actually come to pass. I'll, I'm done. Um, well, we're, we're, we're not like God yet, but I, I'm saying that eventually we will be like God. The disciple's not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. It's in Luke 4, uh, 640, right? So um, I don't know even what I'm eating for breakfast tomorrow, right? So in that way, I don't know the future, but it's obvious that God has a level of understanding that is bigger than anyone who's ever existed on this earth, 
And so we can confidently say God knows the future without um, opening the door of, does that mean he knows every single possible outcome or does that mean he's determined what the future is going to be? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Again, we don't know how to define the word all. We'll just, just put that out there. We have to read these in there. We can't define all. Let's make them smaller so we can understand them. Hi, Pastor Jeremy. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you both as well for uh, participating in this debate tonight. It seems pretty clear to me that both of you are operating kind of from different epistemological assumptions. Pastor Jeremy operating from the infallibility of the Bible and Quaker probably operating from a Latter-day Saint metaphysical point of view. Can you where, go to like 0.75 speed? Sorry, I speak like Ben Shapiro sometimes when I just really have to get a <laughs> point across. Um, so this, my, this question is actually for Pastor Jeremy. Uh, Pastor Jeremy, um, one of the, um, during the uh, cross-section of Quaker, you mentioned you had kind of an objection for his, uh, for his understanding of the laws of logic. Yep. You said that the laws of logic were immaterial, so how can you know the laws of, laws of logic were, were real? Or were certain. Were, were certain. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to provide maybe a small rebuttal and maybe, per, maybe get your thoughts on this. It seems to You're me gonna that... You're going to ask a question, right? Uh, I would just wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, get your thoughts on this, okay. at least, in the sense that it seems to me that the immaterial flows from the material instead of the material from the immaterial, at least within, within our existence. You know, we can recognize ideas, and for instance, the laws of logic are not necessarily created, they're, they're more discerned. I, they flow from objects around me, and as I perceive reality, the, the definition of logic is to understand reality, to understand physical reality. So it seems to me that the immaterial logic, those ideas, flow from material, and thus, I, I, I don't see kind of the point to your original point to, I don't, I don't see kind of the, the validity of the argument that you originally posed to Kwaku. Okay, does, so that, does that make sense, as I, how I phrased it? Sure, but what's your question? My, my, my question to you would be, how, does, how do you respond to that? How would you respond to that objection or to, or to that rebuttal to your, to your argument? I would just have to ask you how you know that whatever you posited there was true. How do you know that the things that just float out of your mouth are certain and true? How do you mean? Because I, well, I, I perceive them from a material reality outside of me. And are there things that you can't perceive and can't see that are real? Mm, yes, but they're material. In Latter-day Saint theology, spirit, spirit is matter. And that's your presupposition that I disagree with. And I, I would ask you why that's your starting point. I believe that that is actually the witness of Scripture, and I believe that that's the witness of Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles. So we would get together and have a little study and see if that's really what the Scripture said. Okay. Well, I mean, from your understanding of Nefesh, I think it was actually pretty flawed, at least in the sense that in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, Nefesh doesn't refer just to the soul of man, but actually right. refer to the entire body of man. Yeah, it refers to many things. God created us not just as souls, but as bodies and spirits. But it says that he breathed the nephesh. And so if you're saying in Genesis 2-7 that he breathed a physical body into Adam, you would have a hard time uh, interpreting that verse. I think that there are other scriptures we could talk about, but I won't, I won't belabor that point. My last question to you, pa uh, oh, okay. Pastor Jeremy, would be um, in the Hebrew Bible, it's also known that the word, I, I, think, I believe that the word is amaharam. I'm not exactly sure what the term is, but... The term that's translated from everlasting to everlasting and from eternity to eternity doesn't necessarily mean outside of time, but rather just a long time. I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Sure. The word for eternity is olam, and when it says from eternity to eternity or from everlasting to everlasting, um, there is uh, a way that the, there was something that the author was intending to get across. And what the authors of Scripture were intending to get across is that God is unlike all of creation because He is Creator that exists in a different way than all of creation exists. And uh, there could be probably no way that Scripture could communicate to you that God exists out of time because you will fiercely hold on to your presuppositions. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Um, you might get this a lot, but can I get the full pronunciation of your name again? Kwaku. Kwaku, okay, yes. I, I apologize. No, I just want to okay. make sure I'm getting that right. So I, I have two questions if I can squeeze them in. First question is if God, as you would describe it, is described as three parts, um, does God share his control with three parts? And also, does God have full control over every situation? So I don't, I don't believe God is three parts. I believe there, God is, when I, refer to, when I say God, I refer to God the Father. I believe the Father, Son, and the Spirit are three separate gods 
united in testimony, mission, unity in every way. Else they're united, but they're physically three separate beings. Okay, so then the, the question would be, does God share his control with the three separate people or the, the separateness that you have described? Um, I would say yes. So I, I, I pull that from scripture because the invitation to that is that it's even going to be extended to us, right? So we're going to reign with God. Um, we're going to be joint heirs with Christ. Um, we're going to be lifted up and sit on his throne. So to me, that suggests there is an open door to sharing of glory and sharing of power and authority, right? So, I mean, you, you get into uh, things like the Divine Council in Psalm 82 and a lot of Michael Heiser's scholarship. It's, it seems to be pretty clear that this is, a, this is a door that's wide open. And I would just add, go to jeremyhoward.net to see a rebuttal of Michael Heiser's worldview. <laughs> we, we should probably go to the next one. Uh, next question. How much time do we have left? Okay, well, really quickly then, um, you stated um, that, that both God the Father and the Holy Spirit are, are separate beings, correct? Which means, and if, I, if I'm just understanding this correct, that they ascended to that position from a point of originally being a, a man to begin with. Is that correct? Um, it's, Joe Smith said that about the Father, but I don't believe he said that about the Spirit. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty positive he didn't say about the Spirit. Well then, at least for the Father, would you say that if God the Father was once a man, would he also be subject to the same, um, the same temptations, and would you say that God the Father, as a man, could have sinned? Um, no, he never did. Uh, so, it, it, Joseph Smith actually made clear, um, we have this from, uh, scholarship about the King Paul Discourse, Joseph the Seer taught the following principles that God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ was once the same as the Son or Holy Ghost both having redeemed the world and became the eternal God of that world which made the, e which made the equal and the Holy Ghost would do the same. So if Christ never sinned and was sinless and God the Father was a redeemer on a different world then we could presume he was also sinless. And my only rebuttal to that is the Mormon worldview states that God the Father died, and in Scripture, death is inextricably tied to sin, and no one dies who is sinless. Uh, Jesus died because the whole sins of the world were laid on him. I, okay. Out of time. So yeah, if you've got any more time? questions, chat with us. Uh, stick around.